Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 857. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is May 22nd, 2024. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. This is my happy place and George's happy place. We sit down in front of our computers. We have a whole bunch of stories we like to talk about. We usually talk about some stuff going on in our lives. Sometimes when we're really bored, we'll talk about the weather. You see that sunshine back there? That's Las Vegas. That's 82 degrees, beautiful weather, Fahrenheit. Got a large audience, sorry about that. And so this is this is fun for us. And so every once in a while, hopefully once or twice a week, you see us sit down and talk about the news. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. Now, there's been a lot of life stories between George and Kevin the last 10 days that uh, we're gonna keep, keep, kind of catch you up with a little bit. Um, because it just deals with our stress levels and what's going on. Uh, my stress level is at 10%. Uh, George is probably at 11%, uh, just because there's a lot going on in our lives. And so we've not been regularly able to get our computers synced together and do our broadcast. Uh, Ryan was great to, to hop in last week and update uh, everybody on the uh, uh, United Methodist Church, Global Methodist Church uh, uh, news. And I'm glad you guys got to watch that. If you did not get a chance, please watch episode 856. George, it's 82 degrees here. What are you doing down in Florida? Oh, I'm having a wonderful time. Yeah. I was actually in Seattle most of the past uh, 10 days. Mm -hmm. My wife and my daughter are in the hospital, different hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both not well. And I had to go out and sort of take care of things uh, uh, and all that. Uh, so, it's all, so it's been a stressful time as I worry my... My daughter was discharged from the hospital, but my wife is still in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And she'll probably be there another two weeks, the doctor thinks. So we'll just pray every day for her recovery. Um, I, and in the midst of all this, my heart doctor has said, George, we need to go back in and replumb something. So mid-June, uh, I've got you marked down for another roto-rooter, not a roto-rooter job, yeah. but another an electrical job. And so all these things are happening, but where all this is, is I just see God's hands at work in so many places. And I've just felt the love and support of my friends, of Kevin, of my congregation. Um, sometimes, you know, for, for 10 years now, I've been the one helping. So it's always George to you. In the last few weeks, I've had so many people who've been able to help me emotionally, spiritually, praying for me. Somebody got me an airplane ticket on frequent flyer miles on Delta. Mm. And it allows them to display their love and their affection and their faith. And, you know, just seeing how God works is remarkable. That out of all this darkness, so much joy and love and power is being revealed of the Holy Spirit at work. And that's, I mean, people need to understand, you know, George and I are real people and we're real Christians. And our prayer every day is that by the end of the day, we're still glorifying God in all this. And mm -hmm. George is glorifying God in all this. Uh, the stress and uh, uh, the 10% the stress I feel, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I'm still glorifying God. My wife and I are, have an amazing time doing what we're doing here, still traveling. Um, uh, despite losing half our income for a little while, we'll, we'll replace that. I assure you, but you know that's that's it, that's just life, you know. And this is how Christians go through life. You 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 get to experience God in uh, the low places. You know, so many people in Western culture think Christianity is just experiencing God in the high places. Coming out of church, oh, I'm just so emotionally drained because I had a wonderful worship service. Well, that's not what Christianity is really, really about. Christianity is about finding God in the darkness and having Him reveal, reveal Himself there. Through our sufferings, through our fears, through our brokenness, we can find a closer, deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, knowing that He is carrying us through these dark times. 
So if you ask me how I'm doing, I say, well, part of me is numb. In other words, my stomach is numb and, uh, I, you know, I'm like emotionally exhausted. But at the same time, I'm filled with joy. Mm -hmm. I have peace in my heart. I wake up singing and uh, uh, I... I cut myself shaving sometimes, uh, so my stress is so some of my things I'm not paying attention to as closely as I should. But, you know, with Christ, you can overcome any obstacle, any, de any defeat, any brokenness. Yeah. And I see it happening in my life now. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, I, I don't want to take forever to talk about this, but, you know, we're not just broadcasters. We don't just... Uh, pontificate uh, the news that's around us. We actually are living Christians, and uh, mm -hmm. when we go through things, I want you to know that so you, you you're not just looking at Kevin and George's uh, people on a webcam. We're, we're real people, and we live real lives, uh, even though we seek out the warmer temperatures in the country. George, let's move on to the news. Oh, if you please keep us in your prayers. Uh, you know, uh, God is certainly in control in in both of our situations. And uh, uh, pray for George and his family, and pray for Kevin and his family. Um, we, we would love for you to do so. Let's move on to the news. You sent me some stories in your perfect formatted uh, way. Um, and before we talk about the first story, I need to talk to you about um, different countries around the world uh, that you would think have freedom of speech, that you would think would be protectors of uh, liberty, life, and happiness. Uh, believe it or not, England is not one of those. You cannot have free speech in England or the UK. Um, pff, Mexico, no free speech. Uh, in fact, in most countries around the world, wonderful westernized countries, Singapore, no free speech. There is just no free speech uh, at, at a productive level. And believe it or not, Canada is the same way. And we have a, Can a Canadian story we have to talk about. In Georgia, I have to be kind of careful on how we talk about that because Canada does not allow uh, for free speech. Uh, there's a famous uh, case right now where the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has basically made a ma uh, writer's life miserable because he published a, a book about Justin Trudeau. And uh, this guy has spent uh, five years in court going broke just because he wanted to write a book which would be perfectly appropriate and funny and entertaining here in america but uh, it it got the ire of justin trudeau and uh, um, do, you, do you do you remember a few years ago there was a canadian anglican blogger who <laughs> made a, a joke where he posted a picture of the north korean dictator and sort of likened it to the bishop of niagara <laughs> michael bird and bird sued him and one and uh, what you know it just it's a different world in canada you know uh canada has in it going through a tough time and uh free speech is one of the things so we have to be careful because you know the i i'm judgment proof the only thing i have that it's a, a lawyer could take are the books and back of me yeah uh, but well, I, you know, I i i don't I, even I, want to give them that i as a key principle of a company i i'm judgment proof too but i don't want to go through the, the the motions of being sued you know that's just it's annoying and we've been threatened many times with anglican ink and with unscripted but nothing has ever come to fruition and so understand that we want to be more descriptive and characteristic as george and i happen to be when we talk about stories but we're going to play this one pretty straight and we've talked about this in the past. Uh, Bishop Todd Atkinson has been brought up on charges uh, by the ACNA bishops. And we now have a verdict, George. Todd Atkinson has been deposed from the ordained ministry of the Anglican Church in North America. He uh, came in, uh, had a sort of a network called Via Apolis Apostolica. Apostolica, yeah, something like that, yeah. In Canada, he's Canadian, uh, sort of in the in the prairie states somewhere, prairie provinces, and he was brought in through ANIC, ANIC. And what the uh, report has found was that even before he was brought into the uh, Anglican Church in North America, there were some issues raised about his pastoral uh, practices. 
and things got from, went from bad to worse, leading to the tr trial. Meanwhile, he had become the assisting bishop in the upper Midwest uh, when uh, um, Stuart Ruck had, you know, had to step aside while his case was being handled. And this recent verdict uh, found that he engaged in pastoral misconduct with women, uh, the wives of the pastors under his charge. Uh, there were accusations of emotional affairs, emotional manipulation. He sent one woman 11,000 text messages over three months. And, then and he was also accused of being a spiritual. <laughs> I mean, that's, he was that's also accused of being a spiritual spiritual bully and a manipulator. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what the court found. And on Anglican Inc., you can read the full, basically salacious details. And Kevin and I, if we characterize our thoughts about uh, Bishop Atkinson could get sued if we call him X, Y, or Z. So I think it's more productive to, to say, how in God's name did this guy ever get into the door? And that's the and that George is the problem. Okay. Now I am friends with everybody in the story, and I'm gonna uh, my my face is gonna be a little tense and angry because when we we talk about bishops, we need to talk about people, you know, who are brought in to be above reproach. That mm -hmm. stories like this should never happen. That there should never, you know, um, that. And when there is something like this, we have instant accountability, which we had. The the, the bishop from the Upper Midwest was it? No, um, Great Lakes. Bishop, Great Lakes bishop. Great Lakes. Um, he had a, a problem with pornography. Um, it was discovered. Uh, the College of Bishops correctly said, "Listen, we'll deal with this initially in a private way. You can get counseling." Uh, he was not able to overcome it, and uh, it was decided all should part ways, and they'll find a new bishop. That's the way it's supposed to be done. But here we have uh, a um, person who was known to have a problem and brought into the church by Charlie Masters and who was the other guy? Trevor, Trevor Walters. Trevor Walters. How? Well, the, the College of Bishops basically... Charlie Walters and Trevor Walters. Charlie Waters Masters. and Walters. <laughs> Charlie Masters and Trevor Walters. <laughs> yes. Saddled the College of Bishops uh, with a real stinker. Mm -hmm. They did not do their due diligence because they knew ahead of time it, the, the statements, the uh, findings were. And this is... First off, what were they thinking? What were they doing? Were they looking at, oh, well, we can add all these new congregations and double, you know, increase our numbers and we'll just keep this guy under scrutiny. I'm speculating what their thought processes were, but this is the worst scandal of the Anglican Church in North America to this point. Yeah, fair uh, done. This is, this without, is it. Without, without yeah. any, this yeah. is it. Because it's... Uh, they knew better or if they didn't know better they should have known better uh to bring in somebody who was accused by people out in canada of almost being a cult leader mm -hmm. i don't know if that's true or not but that was the accusation yeah, accusation only yes and um, instead of instead of saying well wait stop you know maybe we need to look at this clo more closely it was ever onward ever upward more people more growth we got to keep the numbers going um, I don't know what Charlie was thinking. Well, I don't maybe we need a tall bishop. That's what they were thinking. You know, it offset the pictures a little. I don't, you know, because I sit here and this is my frustration. This is, we left the Episcopal Church and we left the Church of Canada because they used to do this. Mm -hmm. This is not something we should be repeating. This is the last thing we should be repeating. We need to find leaders in the church who are above reproach. So at the end of the day, when there is an investigation, uh, you can find a way to hold them accountable or to uh, uh, find them uh, without sin. And you, what you, you found is a story that it, it, it's so sad to read. You know? 
Okay, have we covered that? Um, you know, any uh, uh, of my lawyer friends out there, just uh, let me know if I, I really screwed up. But I think we got that covered. Um, and hopefully we hear from uh, uh, some people what they think in the comments below. All right, Church of Ireland, Synod Explosion. It was, well, I haven't seen the video yet. You told, you told me there's a video. Maybe I can post one here on the on the Anglin Script episode. Family of Enoch Burke. We talked about Enoch Burke uh, uh, several times. He was a uh, teacher at a uh, Church of Ireland school. and In the Republic of Ireland, yes. Yeah. And one day, he refused to address a child by that child's preferred pronoun. And, well, as you can imagine, all hell broke loose because it's a Christian school, right, George? Well, you would have thought, but it's yeah. Ireland. And Ireland has gone super woke. And he was suspended for refusing to use the preferred pronoun. Even though it's a private church school, mm -hmm. uh, the church authorities said, well, we need to cater to this child. And Burke fought. And he came back to school to go to work, even though he was not, uh, he, even though this headmaster had, uh, suspended him. Well, I uh, got to court, and Burke and the judge basically said, cut it out. Burke said, no, I'm going to stand for what I believe to be the gospel truth, that God created the male and female, and I'm not going to mix things up, and I'm not going to deny uh, the revelation of God in the scriptures, nor am I going to deny the truth of biology, of chromosomes, and all this stuff. Well, Burke has been in jail for contempt. Well, I'm sure you got that after a week, right? They, no, you know, no, no. He refused. He refused. The, he, the judge said, if you say you're sorry and if you step down, if you, you know, Burke is prisoner of conscience. Um, and he's still in jail. Well, the Church of Ireland held its synod and Burke's family came and crashed it and stormed the microphone and berated the church for its cowardice because uh, Michael Jackson, who's the Archbishop of Dublin, under whose jurisdiction Southern Province this took place, has said nothing, has done nothing. Uh, McDowell, the Archbishop of Armagh, the head of the Church of Ireland, has said nothing, he's done nothing. And the video, uh, which uh, Chris Pierce, for our friend who lives in Ireland, uh, sent us uh, a link to some of the videos, shows McDowell like looking like a deer in the headlights, like, you know, nobody ever <laughs> interrupts Synod. You know, this is... Uh, crazy and so they had to end the synod because it was total pandemonium and, and anarchy because the family would not sit down and be quiet good and good i, I mean i i'm not really for protest but if you're still in an irish gulag because uh you know you are standing for your rights and for free speech and for uh the conscience of the christian church and your church isn't there protect, protecting you Go to the microphone and protest. This is ridiculous. We've had, we've had cases like this in the United States, and almost all of them that have gone through the appellate court system have been found in favor of the teacher refusing to use preferred pronouns. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was a recent case, I think it was Ohio or Virginia, where somebody was awarded half a million dollars in damages against the school district for their uh, kowtowing to some poor, unfortunate child's delusions. Um, but as you mentioned, Kevin, free speech and the freedom of thought is under fire in the Western world. Um, Jordan Peterson, this is how he got his start at the University of Toronto. He refused to be bullied by the activists and using preferred pronouns that he thought that he knows are nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, well, the Church, Church of Ireland did some another synod before uh, uh, they did did do one thing. Uh, that I think is sort of uh, interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, the baptism, yeah. 40% yeah. of births these days in Ireland are out of wedlock, which is extraordinary, thinking what Ireland once was, uh, where, you know, that women who had children, illegitimate children, they'd be put in poor houses and, you know, the children taken away and this and that. Now it's up to 40%. Well, the Church of Ireland's liberal wing put forward a motion to allow the baptism of the child of an unwed mother. Because this is one of these old Victorian era rules that had just been on the books and it's probably ignored, you know, a lot of the times. Well, the conservatives said, no, no, we're not gonna do this. 
uh, the liberals have been pushing so hard on the gay front and other fronts that we've reached the point that even when the liberals push something that is sort of halfway, yeah, I guess so, the conservatives are going to say, no, we're not going to do it just because <laughs> you want it done. Uh, maybe we'll bring this back next time around and we'll pass it, but just because you support it, we're going to say no. So to this day, the Church of Ireland's official stance is that if you have an unwed child, it cannot be baptized. Uh, yeah, you, don't have an, uh, you don't have an unwed child. You have a child. <laughs> That's right. An unwed parent. <laughs> child of an unwed parent. You're right, Kevin. Uh, I'm uh, no, no. It's right. okay. People understand, you know, we got a lot going on in our lives, and some of these stories are so stupid, it's hard to report them accurately, you know. All right, let's go on here, and I got more show notes from you. I just done a different page on my computer, and uh, you, you and I talked about this in the pre-show that you know the, the Episcopal Church um, hires wackies once in a while, and they, they generally make the news. Now, we've reported in the last couple of months, you know, that this not just limited to the Episcopal Church; it can be uh, in Orthodox churches as well. But wackies are out there. And there is a pro-BLM, Black Lives Matter, uh, wacky who will not conduct the Eucharist at his church until things change, George. This is a weird one. Uh, it's in the sense that the Episcopal Church has disciplined one of the nut jobs. General <laughs> Convention is about to take place this summer, which is the greatest gathering of nut jobs. Uh, Bar none. You'll see this year, bar none. <laughs> you know, e e every wannabe little tin pot dictator and kook and single interest person shows up at General Convention. There was a guy, his first name is spelled K-A-Y-C-E, so I don't know whether it's Casey or Case. Case Ramney, Ramney, who is a man, is was the vicar or rector of Sharon Chapel in the Diocese of Virginia. And in 2022, he said he's going on a Eucharistic fast. He is not going to celebrate Holy Communion until the Episcopal Church takes a major stand against white Christian nationalism and white uh, power and all this and that. Now, forgive me, I still haven't actually seen any scene or I still don't know what Christian nationalism or all this that is, but putting it aside. And the Diocese of Virginia actually said, wait, 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 wait a second. This is a step too far. And so the bishop kindly, you know, First, it started with the local area leader, the dean, and then the assistant bishop. And then the bishop twisted this guy's arm and said, you can't do this. You cannot do this. And he said, no, this is principle. They said, fine. And he was put on trial, and the, and the trial board voted to depose him. And the bishop will decide whether or not to implement this uh, penalty or some such lesser penalty. But he'll probably be deposed. Well, he's he's a white person, and he's got all the white guilt you'll ever need. You know, yeah, enough for all of us, and Lord howdy. <laughs> all right, let's talk about some uh, Church of England news. Jill Duff, who we talked about three or four times the last year, uh, she is a bishop in the Church of England, and uh, she has been a conservative, not stalwart, but a conservative voice in the LLF debates and uh, the conservatives have looked to her and said, at, at least we got Jill. You know, she's on our side. And, you know, what could go wrong when you have a, uh, a female bishop who's on your side? And, George, something went wrong this week. Something big went wrong. David Morris was uh, consecrated in, as an assistant bishop in a Welsh diocese. He's 38 years old. He's a gay man who is engaged to be married to another man. He's an out, active, non-celibate gay man. Mm -hmm. And Jill Duff was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York to represent the Church of England at this consecration service. So Jill Duff, who's in Lancaster, which is his Diocese Bishop of Lancaster, which is nearby Wales, went over and she laid hands on David Morris during the ceremony consecrating a gay bishop. Now, Duff, the, the Charlie Bell, who's a gay activist in the Church of England, immediately tweeted a picture of her with his hands on her with her hands on Morris, saying, "How can the conservatives, you know, say they want structural differentiation when one of their leaders is participating in the ordination of a gay bishop?" 
And Duff was interviewed by the Church Times on this point, and she said, well, it was just good manners. I was asked by Welby to do it. And besides, you know, England's been mean to Wales for 1,500 years. True. And essentially, okay, that's essentially true. It, it was all, it's sort of a, mo you know, just to be not, good manners overrides theological concerns. What's the big deal was her mindset. Now, the past is a foreign country, somebody once wrote. And for Jill Duff, the Anglican past is a very foreign country. In 2003, I went to the consecration of Gene Robinson in New Hampshire. And Peter Akinola asked me to make a list of every bishop there who laid hands on, every bishop, and get photographic evidence if I could. And I did. And every bishop from the, who participated in the Robinson consecration was basically written off of the conservatives list of uh, bishops. Yep. Um, when we had this emergency primates meeting after the consecration, uh, uh, in, around Robinson's consecration, Peter Akinola and Henry Arambe, Arambe and uh, Drexel Gomez and a number of others refused to receive the Eucharist with Frank Griswold because of Griswold's role in the consecration of Gene Robinson. And never again would an, any of these people and their bishops, you know, Nigerian, Ugandan bishops, have any, any relation, ecclesial relationship with the consecrators of Gene Robinson. Jill Duff has put herself in the same position. And she has now basically made herself persona non grata with the conservative world outside of England. Within the Church of England, uh, there's an American expression, screw the pooch. She's just so messed things up that, you know, it's almost unredeemable. Only in Christ can it be redeemed, but at this point, politically, it's unredeemable because there's pandemonium in conservative circles where how could she let us down like this? We're fighting for structural differentiation, and she's just shown it doesn't matter that she's willing to go along to get along. Um, Either well, Justin Welby Genius. is either the cleverest man going because he got her to self-destruct. Huh? He slit a knife into her back without her knowing it. Or she is not that thoughtful a person and did not realize what she was doing. But the long and the short of it is that the conservatives in the Church of England have taken a hammer blow for the thoughtless action done by this woman. It's it's strange because, you know, what's it all about? Well, this is what it's all about. You know, do, do we as Christians uh, honor what we read in the Old and New Testament about how God designed us and the world uh, to be with him? Or do we just say, we'll do it our own way? And, you know, when Jill con laid hands on uh, the consecration here, she's saying, yeah, we can do it our own way. We'll, we'll just do it our own way. And that's what it's all about. You know, that's why we're here. I remember when uh, everything happened in New Hampshire, uh, my bishop at the time was Andrew Smith in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And he became a pry in Connecticut. We had the Connecticut Six who refused to take communion with him and were brought up on charges of uh, to be deposed. It broke down before it got that far. But, um, you know, there was a time, and that time should still exist, where you do not participate in things. You, you don't bless what God cannot bless. That's a real simple rule, right, George? I, well, I had a little meet, a pastor meeting this morning with a parishioner whose uh, niece is getting married to another woman this weekend, and she wanted to know what she should do. She sh and, you know, she should go to the wedding, she sh should go to their sister. And I said, well... You know, here's George's Episcopal answer. Skip the wedding, go to the reception. If you value what is taking place at the religious service and something is taking place that it is contrary to your conscience, do not go to that. But the social secular thing that follows, you will, this person is still a member of your family and you still have an obligation to them as a family member, but you do not have to throw in the towel out of politeness and kindness on moral issues. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a person's niece, it's a family member they've known all their life. 
Jill Duff doesn't know David Morris, or she's, you know, this is not a buddy. This is not somebody who said, well, this is a good friend. And I would, and she did, in other words, she could have just stood to one side, or she could have gone to the reception. But instead, she jumped in whole hog and participated in the in the rite of, con of consecration and laid hands passing on the apostolic succession of, you know, the bishop episcopacy onto this man. Well, and so, uh, uh, let's back up. I'm not just a little upset with Jill here. I'm any bishop who was there doing it uh, is uh, not above reproach in my book. So, you know, I, I don't want to just say it's all Jill's fault, but you know, it, it's crazy. Uh, let's move on to some uh, Greek Orthodox Church news. We don't talk about them too much. In Africa, a uh, Greek bishop from the uh, Greek Orthodox Church made what has not been made before, and that is a female deacon. George, how does that happen? Well, the Greek Orthodox Church of Africa, which mm -hmm. is based in Alexandria and which is all over the continent of Africa, its bishop in Zimbabwe ordained a woman to be to the diaconate. He did not make her a deaconess. He did not uh, order her a deacon. He used the right that is used for men to become deacons. Now, the Greek Orthodox Church in Africa had begun to study this, but this fellow went ahead and did it. And just the past week, the patriarch of the Greek Orthodox Church in Africa said, wait, 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 this was done without a permission, without our knowledge. We're studying this issue, but we haven't said yes to it. So this is uh, akin to the Philadelphia 11 of uh, bishops in the Episcopal Church ordaining women to the diaconate uh, without the approval of general convention that they could do this. And in essence, making facts on the ground so that, you know, this woman's ordination is lawful, but illicit, meaning she is a deacon, but she was done, but it was done without the authority of the wider church. Now, Francis, you know, Pope Francis gave an interview with CBS and he said he closed the door to women deacons in the Catholic Church this week. I don't know what yeah, it's going to be. Wait, he finally has a line in the sand from Pope Francis. All right, good. But the, uh, but the, uh, and you can find women, you know, in the Russian Orthodox Church, the heads of uh, convents are ordained a special type yeah, of deaconess. Yes, 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 yeah. I mean, but they're not the interchangeable office of deacon. Mm -hmm. which this woman was. And so this was a major event, this ordination in Zimbabwe of this woman. But the Greek church is trying to walk it back. And I don't know how far they can walk it back, because once the door has been opened, uh, you're going to see other bishops who are, who are so minded to do this. There are, for instance, there's a Greek Orthodox Church in America bishop who is uh, a year or two ago uh, celebrated the baptism of uh, the child of a gay couple mm -hmm. and all the pictures were there and everything and he has been very supportive of the lgbt qrstuvwxyz movement on, on anglican tv we've always shortened that to queer community because there's too many acronyms in there and so you're going to find other so not every orthodox bishop is um it's orthodox with the small o uh so you're probably going to see this pop out in other places. No, no, no. I mean, the, the real, you say pop out, yes, but be reported in the uh, Orthodox press, probably not as much as, uh, you know, stuff that happens in the Anglican Church. Let's move on and talk here about, I mean, this is a no story, but the uh, Church of England has uh, put a little press release out on their tenants, and by, by golly, they're up 5% in 2023, George. Yeah, they uh, reported their 2023 attendance figures earlier than usual. Usually it comes out in the summer. Mm -hmm. And they've uh, the, uh, the press release basically focused on that it was up 5%. But if you dive into the figures, it's a very different picture. They're still below the 2019 pre-COVID levels. They've declined 20% in five years. Children are not coming back. Um, the, the decline of the Church of England, which had been about 3% per year, is now increasing. So there's almost a straight line decline, you know, into the, of 3%. And what COVID did, it didn't 
change the trajectory, it just sped it up. And what we're seeing here in, in the financial world, I remember this, is, maybe this makes me old, but there was a thing called the dead cat bounce. A stock, can, a stock can go up, eat, you know, if you throw a dead cat off the top of a building, when it hits the ground, it's still going to bounce up a few inches. And some stocks are like that. The Church of England had their dead cat bounce after COVID because, you know, COVID well be shuttered the churches and said it wasn't important that you actually go to church. And what people basically said is, okay, it's not important that we go to church. And that's not changed. People still say it's not important that we go to church. All right. Uh, okay. This is going to be a fun story. We're going to talk about the Pope Francis interview in 60 Minutes. And in the history of the church, we've had Calvinism, Arminianism, um, uh, Augustusism. We now have Francisanism. Uh, Pope Francis sees no evil is uh you know kind of the, the headline i got out of the uh the interview he did um changing doctor than i know but um he really set out some new stages that i, I think i want to cover here in the, in the news george did you get a chance to watch the uh, the interview what would you think it's a, i think that he is a secret episcopalian at this stage i can't yeah. really see any difference i mean except for his statements on the the women deacons you know, this guy could be an Episcopal bishop. Yeah. Archbishop. <laughs> well, Fra Francis, we now know, does not believe in the total depravity of mankind. Francis is not a Presbyterian or a Reformed person. Yeah. He believes that at heart all people are good. Now, Catholic doctrine teaches that we were made good, but because yes. of the fall, we are corrupted. We, have, we are corrupted. Mm -hmm. And there is no help in us. And, you know, Paul is quite clear and, you know, the Bible is quite clear about this. Francis comes across more like, uh, if you remember the movie, uh, Anne Frank, the little girl says, but at heart, I believe there's good in everybody. Sure. Yeah. You know, and so we've got this little sort of naive girliness and Francis coming out at heart. Everybody's good. Um, no, uh, you may not buy total depravity. But we are fallen people, and Francis, the way he describes it, denies the consequences of the fall. Well, yeah, as he, as he describes, I mean, um, human history shows us that we are not defaulted to good. We are defaulted mm -hmm. to self. We are defaulted to self-preservation, uh, self-identity, and to to seek anything good beyond that, we, we need a savior to do that. And mm -hmm. here we don't see that. Here, Pope Francis, you know, at, all things being equal, most people are good. No, not, not true at all. In, in this day and age, most people are good because there's still a little bit of influence uh, from the church in society over the last 2,000 years. Western culture has not completely uh, given up on Christianity, but it's getting close. You know, Christianity has certainly lost the benefit of the doubt. I was in Seattle, as I mentioned earlier, this, you know, for mm -hmm. about a week or so. And I saw, to my shock, horror, and dismay, two or three smash and grab robberies. Mm -hmm. I was in Safeway, and they, in Seattle, downtown, and this uh, guy came up with a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, his credit card didn't work, and so he walked out. And the manager tried to stop him, and there was a little wrestling match, and the guy ran out with all this food. At a CVS, I was in line getting soap and razor blades or something, and this guy came up, obviously a hobo, drug addict, picked up, you know, how they have these boxes, open boxes of candy, picked up a box of uh, uh, those peanut candies i can't okay, remember yeah, the name yeah, that's fine and then he picked up a beach chair and then he picked up a soda and he just walked out the door and i said i was cashier she said well you know that's the cost of doing business in seattle um and for me it was so shocking because in first off i was appalled at myself because i did nothing uh i just was like i did nothing but whereas i assumed about myself that i would always stand for right justice and righteousness but no I did nothing. I just watched it take place. Second, the both in both cases, the store people, well, that's just the way it is. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It's part of the doing business. You know, the reason why avocados are twice the price they are here than in Florida is not because of transportation, but because of we have to cover our thefts. The decline of law and order is made manifest in the actions of people in this daily life. It is. And I it's, mean, one of the things that is part of the architecture of Western culture is that the law applies to everybody. Nobody is above the law. And here we're watching the breakdown. The law doesn't apply to you if you're homeless. The law doesn't apply to you if you uh, are a certain wage, don't make enough money. The law doesn't apply to you um, if you have a social uh, grievance against your government over Israel or abortion or uh, BLM. And so it, we, we broke down that, that initial strong architecture of the, the laws applied to everyone. Mm-hmm. And when, when you take out that little cornerstone of the West, things start to topple real quick. You know, I, I don't want to beat each of them or anything. But, you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun to watch as journalist. George, um, we have been fundraising for you to go to Cairo um, but because of uh, recent incidents uh, around both of our lives, we're not going to be able, able to make a trip to Cairo. We do have somebody going to Cairo on our behalf, though. <laughs> uh, what's the update there? Well, Jeff Walton of the IRD is going for the IRD, but he's also, we're going to basically rely upon him to give us a blow by blow. Sure. Uh, there's, uh, it's not open to everybody. In other words, you just can't show up and not all and most journalists have been turned away but we're very pleased that the GAFCON at the global south people have invited extended invitation to jeff Mm -hmm. and so he's going to do as good a job uh as we could do if we were there in person okay now i'd like to be there i've it it bothers me that i'm not going to be there but uh the doc i can't really leave my wife uh sure well, it, and, it's my, and, and it's also my heart surgery is going to be scheduled around that time. Too. Yeah. Um, we are still going to be covering the provincial uh, conference coming up in Latrobe. I'm going this weekend to the Diocese of the Living Word uh, Diocesan Convention. We'll be live streaming it on Anglican uh, TV. So if you have subscribed at all, if you've ever had that little uh, red rectangle pop up and you click that subscribe button and the bell, you're going to see an announcement. Ooh, live stream from uh, Philadelphia. And uh, you'll get to watch what's happening there. So, uh, how long are we in here? 42 minutes. We're giving you guys a break, okay? Yeah, take the next 20 minutes, get some coffee. That's your 20 minutes because we're not going to do an hour today. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 857 of Anglican Unscripted.